So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce this session, which I know we've all been waiting on. So both Alex Juhas and Ann Balsamo are fast becoming our digital feminist sheroes uh, in their <laughs> radical willingness to create new ways for us to think about uh, digital work, um, digital knowledge production and digital pedagogy, but within a feminist and critical social justice lens. And so we are really excited to have them here talking about their work today in a session entitled Reimagining the Promise of Network Learning, a report on FemtechNet doc on feminism and technology. So let me tell you just a bit about Professor Balsamo and Professor Juhaz. So Professor Balsamo is Professor and Dean of the School of Media Studies at the New School for Public Engagement in New York. She's a groundbreaking national leader in media studies. She's a scholar and media maker whose work links cultural studies, digital humanities, and interactive media. She completed her PhD in communications research at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and began her career at Georgia Tech. And one of my colleagues here uh, uh, noted this morning that she, that she remembered you from Georgia Tech and was excited to come in and hear your presentation today. Um, so in 2003, Dr. Balsamo moved from Silicon Valley to USC where she uh, had been jointly appointed in the Annenberg School of Communications and the School of Cinematic Arts. She directed the Collaborative Design Lab within the Interactive Design Division of the School of Cinematic Arts, and she has been a national leader in the growth of digital humanities, serving on the advisory board of Hashtag. Uh, since its founding in 2003, and in 2011, she published Designing Culture, the Technological Imagination at Work, a transmedia book with accompanying DVD and web linkages to interactive media projects that synthesizes and theorizes the links between her cultural studies scholarship and digital media projects. Next, we have Professor Alex Juhas who is a professor of media studies at Pitzer College in California. She has her PhD in cinema studies from NYU and has taught at NYU, Swarthmore, Bryn Mawr, Claremont Graduate University, and Pitzer on YouTube, media archives, activist media, documentary, and feminist film. Dr. Juhas has written multiple articles on feminist, on feminist fake and AIDS documentary. Her current work is, an, is on online feminist pedagogy, YouTube, and other more radical uses of digital media. She is a filmmaker and has produced the films The Owls and The Watermelon Woman, as well as nearly 15 educational documentaries on feminist issues like teen sexuality, AIDS, and sex education. Most recently, she's published a number of books, but most recently she published an innovative video book, which we heard about a bit earlier, called Learning from YouTube, uh, which was published by the MIT Press. And from my understanding, it's the first book of its type, first all digital, all fully online book to be published by an academic press. So she's an innovator in many ways. Um, her earlier digital effort is Media Praxis, a radical website integrating theory, practice, and politics. She also blogs and the link to her blog is in your program. So please welcome professors Balsamo and Yuhas. So thank you, thank you. Oh, that's not on. It's not on. Um, oh great, it is? Okay. okay, so this is fine? Is this fine? Okay, great. So thank you so much for inviting us here. We're really excited to be part of this conversation in a feminist context because one of the things that's happened because of the doc is that we're traveling quite a bit talking to sort of um, leaders in education about MOOCs and uh, digital pedagogy and we often have to side, you know, bracket off the feminist part or excuse it away or pretend it's not there <laughs> and I'm more than happy to do that but it's really invigorating to, to be in an environment where we can actually put that at the center of the conversation. So thank you for including us in this great conversation. And thank you, Mary, and thank you, Brittany, professors, um, for enabling the travel and all the details, even just from Brooklyn to here, which I'm new to the New York area, so it, this was the first time I've made my way to New Jersey since I've been here. 
So today we're going to talk uh, about the dock, but we're going to put in place um, a little bit of the background about how the dock came into existence, um, which is not the first thing that we had actually thought of. It was the constitu constitution of this thing called FemTechNet. And we're actually going to Tag team it. Tag team. So um, Anne and I um, were just having coffee, actually having a chat about our mutual interest in AIDS and um, a project that Anne had just taken on, which she has taken to completion, which is digitizing the AIDS quilt. I was interested in thinking about um, the movement of AIDS representation online. So we were just chatting. We were just colleagues. We had never met before, actually. One thing led to another, and we started thinking about some shared worries that we had and shared desires that we had. And this was over coffee. So that um, we both found that the innovative ways that we were thinking about and using technology were not necessarily being supported or seen outside of um, very small the very sort of small siloed places where we do our work, so for me, media studies, for you, design, probably, um, that the history and thinking that was motivating our uses or innovative use of technology, which was, say, a, a variety of sets of critical thinking that had been um, really important to us as students and as scholars, was not known to people who were receiving our work. So for instance, just as one example, feminist scholarship about technology, people might be receiving learning from YouTube, thinking about it as innovation in technology with no understanding of the feminist underpinnings. And that we lacked a community of scholars, students, and thinkers who could start to make those, conver those connections with us. So that's all we were saying at lunch. Boo-hoo, this is really you know, messed <laughs> up. Um, and then? So uh, comparing our notes and, um, again, some of our, um, yeah, some of our uh, recent histories, we had, all, we had each been you know, participating in various conferences, again, for her project, the Learning from YouTube, for my design and culture. And when I met up with feminists across the globe in the various places, as you did as well, um, there was, there was a, a very palpable um, desire among these feminist scholars across disciplines for an online network. So, and they were like, we've got the tools. Why can't we, where's our online network? And, you know, we all participate in different kinds of networks, but there seemed to be a kind of growing understanding that we needed something that was that was that was not yet there. So this led to um, the development of FemTechNet. You couldn't come up with it. it's the feminist technology network. I mean, there's no cleverness here at all. Um, that we also did over coffee. Yeah, with that, you know. So FemTechNet is, as we call it now, an activated network of scholars and artists, as simple as can be identifying and what's behind here is that th we did not create the network at all. We were already, every one of us, in network relationships, in various kinds of networks through our professional organizations and so on. But what we wanted to do was provide um, provocations and evocations to activate kind of the network connections, to bring people kind of into um, a set of discussions uh, in and around the topic of feminism and technology most broadly, um, and then feminism science studies, feminism new media, feminism digital, humanities, and so on. So that was the earliest, the early history. That was only 18, two years ago, 2012, January 2012. So it's been very recent um, that we had even had the conversations at our local Starbucks. <laughs> So, you know, I guess up front, I'm going to say um, on behalf of both of us that when the network started, FemTechNet, it, it had not yet decided that what it was going to make was the dock. It just was a network. And um, what has been central to what this network has done and will do, and the network can be activated to do anything. It was activated ultimately to make the dock, but it sits online and there's hundreds of people on it from around the world. Um, is that um, uh, engaged feminist process has been uh, the definitive home for this group of very diverse scholars and artists and activists and um, core to everything we've built and everywhere we will go, which is to say that feminist principles that process matters and that process itself is an end result have been just, just been definitive of our work. So at every stage, thinking um, in political and theoretical ways about 
who's in the room, who's not in the room, how decisions are being made, who's, who's not making decisions. I mean, I don't need to tell you guys that. <laughs> um, but it's been really important. And, um, you know, throughout our conversation today, we'll, we'll, we'll um, give you some examples of that. But let me just give you one example here. So ultimately, we're going to make this thing called the doc. We, ha we haven't invented it yet. But we do decide that what we're going to do together is make a course. And we decide it, that... And this is actually at a meeting with maybe 12 face-to-face uh, -face, uh, 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 feminist scholars that happens in California. Uh, we decide that we're going to choose 10 themes around which we're going to organize. And that process of choosing the 10 themes was iterative, interactive, and slow. And it moved through many rooms, people having coffee, people on the internet, other meetings, criticisms of the procedures and standards by which we chose the 10 themes. And ultimately, we decided on three, oh, I don't know, rubrics by which we were going to choose the 10 themes and who was going to speak in the 10 themes. And first, the first one was seniority. So feminists who had been working in the field for a long time. The second was interdisciplinarity. So uh, indicating um, the range of fields in which people are doing the work. And the third was the diversity of positionality. And so then, you know, the sort of like ever-changing group of people who only know each themselves were together online work through these three, or these three rubrics to choose the ten themes, which you'll see soon. But those themselves were highly debated. So, I mean, again, just to give you one example, our colleagues in Europe really are not as keen to think about this diversity of pos positionality framework that I just suggested to you as a way to make decisions in this regard. And um, much more interested in seniority, much more interested in prestige and things like that. And again, you know, it's, these are really interesting conversations that occur, especially when a network goes global. They're sensitive. You know. And as feminists, <laughs> when you are self-aware of power and process, then that becomes part of what you're talking about. So everything we've done, I just want you to understand, has happened with this as the sort of founding principles, and two, with no infrastructural support. So no... Oh yeah, did we mention that part? No resources? No I mean, it's just, and so it looks like a very big project, it is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's happened on the labor, the unpaid and effective labor of people, and this is really connects to Adeline's, um, some of the things she was saying. You know, people doing things because they care, people falling out when they stop caring, you know, et cetera, mm -hmm. and that you're all aware of what that feels Can like. Um, seniority, interdisciplinarity of field, and diversity of positionality. And, and this will become clearer when we talk about the, the constitution of the video dialogue, so that's what we were talking about. So through the, through the process of I mean, literally visiting different um, uh, conferences to network the project, to recruit very explicitly people um, who we wanted participation from, um, uh, to di you know, disseminate the effort, get some ideas. What we were really interested in is, are there other efforts like this going on elsewhere? I mean, we really, you know, again, understanding that many good ideas um, often blossom kind of simultaneously. Uh, through that, we met up with the Fembot Collective. So there was a, an absolute kind of parallel process going on with Fembot Collective. And I have known Carol Stabile and um, Kim Sawcheck for 20 years and didn't know that they had been hatching Fembot Collective because we had not been over, our paths hadn't overlapped. And that was, I think, what was the, the lament of many feminist scholars, activists, artists who were getting together, is that they just didn't know when parallel efforts were going on such that we could start to think about literally collaborating to combine resources and to, you know, to to chunk out the big project in terms of what are you going to take on and what are you going to take on. So in the process, and this is just my note about um, Fembot Collective, you know, the FemTechNet grew up exactly at the same time Fembot Collective. They were, they were in, in advance of us. And during the process, because Carol was there in, the, in the, that first meeting, we over about a year got a much better sense about what was FemTechNet going to do and what was Fembot Collective going to do. So in the dialogue among our two projects, absolutely not seeing these as competitive at all, nor wanting to dilute our resources, figuring out in our kind of conversations what could each of these 
you know, networking efforts take on. And we've come to now to a better understanding. What we were going to do with FemTechNet and what Fem, FemBot Collective, they're really focusing on publication dissemination. So their Ada journal, which is just incredible, and you know, you all are involved in many of these. I mean, that that was we were not going to do take that on. The books aren't dead kind of effort of FemBot Collective, that whole notion of constituting a group of peer reviews for all sorts of feminists, or peer reviewers for all sorts of feminist work, all publishing scholarship dissemination. We decided for FemTechNet, we would get behind the project of pedagogy and to work on the doc. So that's what we took on. So it, it was in those conversations with parallel projects that we learned, and I think this is you or me? Yep. Okay, this is me. Um, so the doc, as you've heard, distributed open collaborative course. In 2013, this is how we publicized it, the doc 2013 was a course focused on the topic of dialogues in feminism and technology. Um, this doc was kind of, again, a kind of processual kind of understanding, both on kind of drawing on our networking discussions and conversations with other uh, feminists, also your work in learning from YouTube, my work in designing culture, and here is the point. It was right on the heels. A, this was April of 2012. The MOOC, the MOOC exploded onto our popular consciousness in, in October of 2011. So we were just a few months past the, the, the beginning of the MOOC frenzy. And almost immediately, as we were talking about taking on a kind of a network learning project, the feminists who we were talking to, the feminist pedagogues, were, were saying, you know, we're not doing MOOC, you know, and the critiques were mounting. Right? The, the feminist critiques, they were seeing it, even if they weren't engaged in these, but they were seeing what was wrong with the, the MOOCs. And so the, the point on, uh, that we took was this was, well, we could, we could all get together and write a white paper on a kind of feminist critique of a MOOC. That was certainly one of our options. But in fact, what we said is, I think the better option is let's design something differently. Let's take the criticism and kind of infuse it into the design of how we would do it differently starting from a different set of principles. Okay, so in contrast to the more authoritative, rigid, and unidirectional <laughs> structure of most <laughs> MOOCs, docs are distributed, equal, and made collaboratively by the professors and students who use them to learn together. So for instance, um, Karen and Elaine were talking about Everyone who taught the doc the first time in its first iteration met for a week over the summer. You know, free you know, on their own, on our own, for a week and designed our class together and hashed it out, worked it through. There were 40 of us. It was quite amazing and really productive. They are not organized for profit, as Karen also said, and each node is equal, unique, and adaptive. Ours is a distributive structure where each nodal institution and its class is an equal player in a shared building and archived conversation. While we share a name, Feminist Dialogues and Technology, and a limited spine of themes that we will get to shortly, each iteration of the course was built from our shared materials, which were then also augmented by whatever else each professor needed to best respond to the characteristics, limitations, and strengths of each distinct learning environment and community. So, the, the critique or the distinctions, distributed versus masses, and this was part of probably one of our foundational um, points. Our point was not to reach the masses. We're not clear from any pedagogical or learning theory that there is a learning platform that can do mass education. Rather, we were interested in using networked infrastructures to reach and constitute a critical mass of people who will be interested and called to be to participate in a set of conversations that they may not have a critical mass of people participating in their own local embodied communities. Um, distributed the focus on knowledge co-creation, the understanding that through the use of networked infrastructures, um, we can more easily um, participate in co-creation of knowledge and insights, and that we didn't understand network pedagogies as, and through the kind of simple <coughs> transmission model of from the masters at the brand name universities down to the unwashed and unknown um, kind of empty vessels. The open versus scripted. Um, here again, when we talk about we had a course, 
what we had was a certain set of structures for a course, but there was no shared single syllabus, which meant every nodal course in the, in the doc um, had their own syllabus that made sense in the institutional context within which they were located. So courses that were in a curriculum or being taught by people in a curriculum who have, um, you know, have uh, appointments in women's studies, they were a women's studies and selected course. I taught a media studies course, someone else taught a cultural studies course, someone else taught a media activism course. So the course and the syllabi was produced by the faculty member in the kind of ways in which he or she would do that in the institutional context in which you were situated. And that is to say we're using technology to, to better what we actually already do at home and to reach people we wouldn't otherwise, but using feminist principles of how we're sort of building out that technology. So if you look at the next two terms, collaborative versus online, what I would want to suggest here is that to me, a commitment, a core commitment to blended learning, to uh, uh, to, to, to X reality learning, to, to, to a, a way of living in the world that is both online and off, and where the offline experience, the lived embodied experience, the specificity of our unique learning environments, the specificity of our own experiences, really matter entirely to the project, which MOOCs just don't understand. This is deep feminist thinking 101. So it's not deep feminist thinking, it's feminist thinking 101. And it was really interesting to hear that is a problem in your project, Karen and Elaine, because I think that by going fully online, you somehow lost that core commitment to what we do in rooms together in, in, in different places as people who learn differently and have um, you know, their distinct histories. And then the commons, a course versus a commons, we built a commons, we're about to show it to you. The commons was where we could come together to blend from our unique, we, uh, we had 18 nodes. And in the commons we, is where ideally, and it didn't work completely, ideally where we would meet. So we had our own courses and then we also had a commons, okay? And our mantra was, and this is our mantra to, to anyone who wants to offer a MOOC, our mantra was who you learn with is as important as what you learn. Or from, who and you learn from. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, as important as who you learn from. And that notion of the kind of distributed network that we're learning, not only kind of the top-down instructor to student, but students to students, and always in an embodied context. And <coughs> do you want to, okay. Um, the, the model, and before we go to the comments, actually, the model was an opt-in, not a top-down. There was really no, um, no kind of uh, campaign to, to generate interest in this other than word of mouth, the caucusing for a different um, presentations at different conferences. And what we asked people to do who wanted to be part of the doc is just participate in the course organization. Just give us your ideas, your insights, you know, let's kind of uh, create the conversation around creating the spine or the, the shared structure. Um, we did ask um, everyone to contribute their own syllabi from which we then mined shared resources. Um, we, so everyone was, um, uh, cre again, uploading, sharing materials. That's what we were requiring. I mean, the requirements were pretty minor. Well, the week of participation was sharing the syllabus, Share the syllabus joining a committee. Joining a committee, uh, assign a shared acti pedagogical activity so that we could start having students imagine uh, possibilities across uh, institutional locations and, um, you know, in the gift kind of notion, contribute the resources that you think are important for the topics that we're going to discuss. Can you do this as the animation for me? Yeah. The doc is distributed or was distributed across 18 nodes in the fall, its first iteration, thereby challenging more typical MOOCs that place large and prestigious institutions or corporations or for-profit businesses as the providers of information to hungry and needy others. In the doc, we have 18 equal nodal sites which are based at art schools, liberal arts colleges, Ivy League universities, state universities, mm -hmm. and even two community-based groups, one in Northampton, Massachusetts, and the other in San Antonio, Texas. The 18 nodes can join together using technology when we choose and when it improves our students' experiences or as our, our own as teachers. But each course has its own syllabus, approaching the course topic from a large variety of disciplines and geared for students at various levels from general education at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo to advanced undergraduate inquiry and media studies, my own seminar at Pitzer to grad students at the New School. Some of our courses were entirely online. This was the case at both Rutgers and Bowling Green State University. At Ohio State University, the course was taught in Second Life. 
some classes were taught to large numbers. My node had 12 students who met each week in three hour seminar face to face. Right. The fields represented among the instructors and the, and the uh, curricula, um, American studies, and you can read them here. So this was also an experiment in cross-disciplinary and cross-domain collaborative teaching. So where our common themes of focusing on feminism, science, and technology, what we also understand about that kind of, that set of topics is of course it crosses many different dif disciplines. Um, here we are, this is just a, a photograph from the, uh, the archive. Here we are at um, Brown University where a number of us are getting ready to film the, um, the video dialogue with um, Maria Fernandez and Lisa Nakamura on feminism science, fe feminism technology and race. And the, the disciplines represented here, media studies, art, art, history, communication, American culture. And I have to say, talking across discipline was one of the harder challenges of this project. Between silos, between schools, across discipline. And it, it's one of the things that the professors can learn the most from. So we started out by saying, well, we all are studying mobile phones. So we all want to think about computers. And each one of us is, and we're feminists. Why aren't we reading each other's work? Why don't we know about each other's work? And then we realized, oh, I'm not reading your work because I hate the way you do that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I don't want to. OK, we that. never really said that. I do. But certainly, yeah. as a humanities scholar, a lot of my work is not legible. Or, or, or rigorous to some of my colleagues in some other disciplines. And the, those were some of the hard process conversations we had to have, and they were really important. But that's the, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the learning work for the professors. So mm -hmm. the interdisciplinary stuff was super challenging. It remains so. And again, I think one of my polemics, to continue to get back to this, is um, for all the rhetoric that goes on in fomenting and um, supporting interdisciplinarity across um, dis you know, across domains at the university, why we don't foreground how feminists have been doing this and having to work through these exact kind of collaboration and knowledge creation across differences. I mean, we've been doing it for 30 years. And those kinds of insights about how one navigates cross-disciplinary, cross-domain, or differences in terms of knowledge construction practices and modes um, don't get brought forward into, we might have lessons to teach about how one does interdisciplinarity on campus. Because of our commitment, we used technology to enable the sharing of resources and experiences across space and time while ever being mindful, no, I'd say while being excited about the differences of situated and distinct learning environments, we learn from these differences too. I'm just gonna give one example. My students at an expensive liberal arts college became very aware of the class privilege of being educated in that situation. And again, I wanna be really clear. Lots of my students are first generation college students. They come from working class environments, but they're being educated at Pitzer College. is not something they think a lot about. It's sort of the air they breathe. And when we were having to interact in a daily or weekly basis with students who were, let's say, at large state universities, whose learning experience was really different, the way they sort of embody themselves as students, how they, um, how they manage their workload. I mean, all of these things suddenly became resonant. And in a class that was using digital technology for education, thinking about digital technology and education became very live for my students. So that class difference, as just one example, was extremely resonant and something we talked about a lot in relationship to the hype of MOOCs, for instance. Again, I could say sort of race and sexuality, the way they play out uh, at a liberal arts college um, that's sort of lefty and hip, it gets talked about in a really different way. My students, my students embody those um, identities in ways that were quite different, they say, from students at Bowling Green State University who are having an online experience uh, in a place where they were not politicized in quite the same way that my students were. So it was really interesting for my students to kind of hit up both their lived experiences as students of color or queer students against primarily white straight students, but also the discourses that they had been sort of taught around that mm -hmm. um, with students who hadn't been taught those discourses in a feminist environment. So like the differences, the, the, the learning, the places where we had difficulty were really productive for my students. Okay. I'm going to talk about the comments. Yep. 
Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there's also a feminist digital pedagogy conference going on right now at the University of Michigan. And Lisa Nakamura is there, and Lana Nelson is there. And Lisa Nakamura just tweeted to me, she just DM'd me that they were looking at the exact same slide. <laughs> 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 you guys That's because Alex goes there tomorrow morning. <laughs> It's really funny. I, yeah, we, it, we needed to clone both because yeah, you're, you're, you're on tomorrow morning. I'm that my body suffered in the name of, oh, of feminism. <laughs> Put it in there, baby. Um, this is the common. So, um, and this, this, and we could have a whole other co uh, conversation, which we will later about, um, or could, about the, the, the uh, tools that we had to use. We had no resources to build this. So everything we were doing had to be off the shelf technologies that everyone could participate in for free, meaning no subscriptions and so on. We had a wonderful um, opportunity to use something called um, the uh, 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 Creative Commons, no, what, media, Commons in a Box. So it's Commons in a Box project sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities in the US that ha creates a kind of DIY commons cr creation kit. We used it to create our version of a commons. This is also the same um, platform that created the MLA commons. So commons in a box is now a kind of digital humanities resource. Um, we knew that we wanted to um, create an online meeting space that wasn't Coursera or um, Canvas or Blackboard or Sakai or so because not all institutions have access to those. So the Commons literally is our bare bones web portal. And it is bare bones in the sense that um, nothing really fancy, lots of plug-in widgets. Um, but in, uh, and what we ended up doing was creating um, uh, uh, you know, creating different tabs, uh, you know, that provide all the kind of background information, um, who the doc and the nodal instructors. So here's again a list of the nodal instructors from 2013 with their kind of connections and titles and numbers of students. Um, Learning resources, this is where when you registered on the Commons to be a member, you could both upload learning resources and, um, and make use of learning resources. So this too was a homegrown effort. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time kind of just skinning it, putting a look and feel on it, doing the information architecture. I wireframed it, someone else came in and, um, and kind of worked on the uh, kind of the Commons in a Box tech uh, kind of uh, techniques. Our videos served from here, our video dialogues. Um, we're also, and have now created an archive. And it has a set of directories. This is, uh, you know, the kind of, um, kind of things that, uh, like our working committees, you can post documents and things like that. It's so, it's, it, it's in one hand um, all in one place and it's also chaotic, kind of representative of the kind of layering through which this, uh, this grew. Um, we've had a pro bono um, uh, t kind of technology wrangler kind of working on this, serving as the, uh, the webmaster and so on. Um, we got through it, but we got through it with a lot of people putting in a lot of um, pro bono work to create even this very simple thing that wasn't even getting to everything we wanted the pedagogy committee was helping us imagine we wanted to do with this. So that's the commons. Commons tech infrastructure. I think this is me as well. Oh, this is all me. Okay, in addition to the commons, which we built, um, we also made, you know, we have a Facebook site. Um, again, somebody else came through and just put the Facebook site up. We made um, our videos are uh, archived on Vimeo. And then during the process, we made um, uh, a lot of use of things like Google Plus and Skype to hold meetings and, and conferences and so on. Um, again, one of, the, uh, one of the courses met in Second Life. Um, different people use different kinds of, you know, we're using Canvas now at, um, at uh, New School, Sakai here. Different people were using, continuing to use Blackboard. Um, University of Illinois, Sharon Irish came through with a really very robust for what's available, um, multi-person conferencing system. And we brought it to its knees. So the most robust enterprise solution online conferencing system available to a very high-tech University of Illinois. What 
the feminists who were engaged in this process wanted to do, we broke the system. Too much talk. Too much talk, too many facilitators, too much wanting one facilitator, one set of slides to the masses. And when we wanted to do things, like do you remember uh, the frustration to share the podium, that, that thing could not, that, that um, enterprise solution couldn't. Anyway, we have a lot of interesting lessons to, to follow up with tech developers. I just wanted to add that um, that conversation that Adeline began for us about what does it mean for feminists to use technologies developed by um, institutions, organizations, with principles that um, we don't follow. We spent a lot of time talking about that. We have an amazing white paper. You can get our white paper off of the commons where the theoretical ideas of the course are spelled out and written beautifully in a co-authored piece by four or five of our collaborators, and that issue is raised there, but we ended up not being able to do that. We just didn't, ha we didn't have funding. And I want to talk for a second about not having funding. Um, we decided not to take our time, our precious time that we could have used to make this thing happen, and it did happen, looking for grants. That was really one of them, too. We were really afraid of the feminist problem, and we nobody wanted to unmake the feminist project into a women in tech project. And so we almost applied for a, um, an NSF grant, and we didn't. Um, and then the other thing that we learned was that um, what, what, what women's studies and feminists has brought us to, at least in my understanding at this point, is a lot of very powerful women who have institutional power. And so a lot of the women in our network, and we had a lot of very powerful women in the network in that sense, could get us a thing from where they worked. That might be access to Blackboard, it might be a $10,000 grant that Wendy Chun got at, at Brown, or the $7,000 grant that I got that got us together once. And we, we sort of collectivized our small power at our, our big power at our small institutions to make a slightly larger pool of money. And I, it felt quite fragile, but deeply feminist as well. It was a sharing of resources that we suddenly all had. Like, you know, we have, we have deans and... Um, <laughs> and the, yeah, there's a lot of power. And, um, <laughs> and so, um, but it really was a problem with the infrastructure. We just didn't have money to do it, to build, right. to, to build something ourselves. And, it, and, and technology ended up often being a hurdle for us. It right. ended up stopping many things that we needed as much as it facilitated them. So yeah. we should. I'm just going to go to the doc by the numbers. In all, we had 27 instructors because uh, several of the nodes, like the one here for you two together, uh, University of Illinois. Um, so although there were 18, there were about 27 people participating more formally as, as struct uh, instructors or facilitators. By my count, and I'm still trying to get some good numbers on this, we had at least 200 students across the 18 nodes. Um, number of drop-in learners, these are people who weren't affiliated with any particular institution, but who participated in the FemTechNet San Antonio or the Mass FemTechNet, about 25, some of whom stayed for several weeks, some who came in for one or two. Um, the level of the students ranged from introduction level undergraduates to graduate students, um, independent studies, uh, seminars. Um, the video dialogues, we had 11 of them up. We've, and again, from my basic count, those videos have been accessed more than 3,000 times. That doesn't, that doesn't really communicate how many people viewed it because every time I, I showed it, I was showing it to my 20 students. So there are more people who saw the videos. Um, we have at least 24 keynote, keyword videos that, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Wikipedia um, outcomes as well. And of course, one of the important statistics that you just mentioned was that we had a 95% or 98%. Um, okay, here's our, here's our back at you MOOCs from our account. For all of the students who enrolled, we only had two students not finish classes. Wow. Two students. Also, I have to tell you, the students love this course universally. I mean, that that was really. It's like a ninety-eight percent completion rate. Yeah. So we gotta move. We gotta move a little faster. Okay. So these are the basic components, um, the kinds of things that we were sharing as the as the opt-in spine. The video dialogue series, and we're going to describe each of these with a little more detail. The video dialogue series, which is the 11 video dialogues that we produce, keyword videos, which are DIY um, videos made around keywords on feminism and technology, the Wikistorm activity Anne's going to discuss, and then some other shared learning activities we're going to um, briefly mention. Um, so the video dialogues, those are um, 
are the kind of 30 to 45 minute um, video pieces. We conceptualize them as a kind of video series. They serve as the spine of the kind of shared learning pathway that defines the course. Those were the themes that we were uh, community sourcing early on. Um, you can see the topics, uh, here's a, a list. It was um, supported by grants. Again, this was the distributed collaborative potluck nature. Um, Pembroke Center at Brown came in early with $10,000. New School pitched in 8,000. Pitzer pitched in another 8,000. Uh, Illinois pitched in a couple, five, 6,000. So we ended up doing these. OCAD University um, pitched in 10,000. So we ended up being able to do these, um, these video dialogues because of distributed kind of contributions from many institutions. A little money, it's like Emily's list, right? Early money is like yeast. A little money is like yeast. The only people who got paid in all of this, other than those of us who were teaching and doing this as part of our contracts, the only people who got paid were the people who were featured as our guest participants in the video dialogues. Because that was one of the polemics I had, is that we ask women to give us their intellectual labor and feminist thinkers and scholars to give us their intellectual labor for free all the time. And um, where I might volunteer to do that on behalf of a course like this, we were asking Lisa and Shuli and um, uh, Cassell and Lynn and Lucy, we were asking them, you know, to schlep their bodies somewhere to come to take time out of their day. So those are the people that we provided stipends for, and that's pretty much where the money went. Uh, much of the other, the other funding was really to, you know, support the videographers, the editors, the cinematographers, the, you know, those who were coding. So really this, the video, the, the reason we had and needed money for video dialogues is because I was trying to at least stem the tide of kind of this un endless kind of free labor by which feminist work gets done. And I'm not going to show you, actually, because um, we're running a little short of time, um, a, a, an excerpt from it. We have a kind of look and feel. Um, the, the, the 11 um, topics are up. There are three more video dialogues that will be shot and, um, and recorded uh, in the spring here. Justine Alondra is shooting right now. That's yes, right. I think there's, I think there's yeah, another one. I just one. did the wiki storming one. Oh, then. yes, right, right, right. So. You can find them. They're just, you know, on Vimeo yeah. or on our site. So please go check right. them out if you haven't seen them. And, 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 you know, I, I ended up serving, um, uh, you know, not by design, but serving as the executive producer for all of these and ended up doing about eight of the, of the moderated discussions, trying to, because I could pay, I could pay to fly myself places. I mean, because I have a travel account. Um, and again, some of the, the polemics here, and I take the point, Elaine, about um, the level of the dialogues were often at a higher level of, of discourse than an introduction to women's studies perhaps would have. And that was, that, was the, that was a decision of the executive producer, having taught women's studies myself and having even my mo most advanced feminist theory courses always being basic level courses. I wanted some feminist material on the web that demonstrated the kind of level of sophisticated feminist dialogue. So we, con we conceptualize these at dialogue. I never asked anyone to, to identify or define basic terms. I was like, it's, it's our job to put the, the horizon of the most sophisticated work out there, or thinking, or discourse, and then the work of us in the classroom is to fill in the details, to, from the sex gender system to you know de-skilling, reskilling, you know labor, and so on and so forth. Um, this it was it was the executive but producer's I, decision. I have to say that uh, you know everyone in this room understands that there are debates within any feminist organization or feminist project about what counts as feminist goals or what counts as your own feminist goals. And, and a set of our, a, a subset of our collective was really behind Anne's interest in producing the video dialogue at the highest end and having that feminist goal of, um, you know, the, the most sophisticated, um, most uh, uh, traditions of feminist thought being made visible. And there was another group of people who really didn't have that as a feminist goal. I mean, the feminist goal was to bring people in at the at the ground level and get them excited about mm -hmm. technology and uh, and feminism. And so the project is open in the sense that Anne sort of went her way. And then um, I would say uh, 
this keyword video project comes in from the other side. So the keyword video project is completely DIY, where the video dialogues are high end and made professionally. The DIY videos, the keyword videos are made by students and faculty members who don't know that much about making video, and they're very accessible. And so both of these things coexist in this open space that holds them. And again, we're, I think we're not going to show them to you because I want to have room for conversation. Um, but there's some amazing student-produced um, keyword videos, and they're on, on video and Vimeo. Um, these are the shared learning activities that we had. And the best way, can you get onto the comments? Mm -hmm. The best way to learn about them, so there's five of them, keyword videos. I've talked about object exchange. I'll show you what that looks like. But again, um, I think Elaine mentioned this. If, you do, if, you're, if you're joining the doc and you don't know about one of the things that we do, we have huge resources available to here. So for instance, if you want to do the teaching with Wikipedia uh, shared um, uh, assignment, this is just full of links and how do you create assignments and I mean you can just see. Um, build out from that, but that's true for all of our shared learning. Um, uh, oops, yeah, I'm in the wrong one. There we go. Key learning projects. Um, and so these are the five of them. And then you just sort of reach into the commons and work from there. Um, Karen had mentioned the Feminist Mapping Project. This was really developed by one of our professors, Karen Kiefer Boyd. She built out this beautiful page about how to um, teach a, it, about feminist mapping. And then a number of the schools did it. I know that, for instance, it was an absolutely favorite activity at Yale. It was, they spent most of the semester doing um, the mapping project. I, I myself didn't do the mapping. Um, the gift giving exchange, I'm sort of, am I there? Yeah, there we go. It's in the teaching and learning. It's here. Gift giving uh, project is, 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 a, is a really, it's a really fun one that, that I've been doing for a while. Again, all of the resources sources that you need are there. So let's go back to the. Now, of course, the most um, famous thing we did was the wiki storming. And. Wiki storming. So uh, it, this was, again, one of my, um, I had been wanting to do this for a long time, um, having, you know, been a scholar of feminist work in science and technology, inspired by Autumn Stanley's book, which if you don't know is 700 and some odd pages um, by Autumn Stanley, who did it as a non-affiliated faculty member, so she was just an, an at-large scholar, where she documents um, you know, several thousand years of the history of women's contributions to science and technology in five different areas. Um, she is one of the unsung he heroes of kind of feminist historiography of science and technology. And any page you would pick in her book, just to open it randomly, and you could go to Wikipedia, you were more likely not to find that woman in Wikipedia that Autumn had worked to uncover kind of her, the traces. So inspired by Autumn's earlier project done in the 1980s, published in 1990, and then the growth of Wikipedia and other projects that were kind of again, bubbling up at the same time, including the Too Few project, which is to garner um, our attention about how few women are represented across Wikipedia as cited or, you know, by name. Um, this kind of combination of a particular cultural amnesia and lack of understanding about the history of women in science and technology kind of, kind of um, uh, combined with the growth of Wikipedia as our kind of default cultural digital archive raised the question of it's time now, and this is my, my point, it's time to, to be a little bit more aggressive about Wikipedia. So that language is mine. I will take responsibility for it. And not everyone in the network liked it. You know, I was like, we have to storm it. I, you know, I've been, t I've been tired of just trying to cajole people to do better citation practices on Wikipedia, to be, you know, more hygienic in their 
kind of feminist citation. I'm like, I, it's, it's time to get, you know, much more polemic about the time is now. We got to get in there. We, you know, history is being written by the fans. And if we don't generate some fan fervor among feminists, young feminists, to get engaged with this, the histories that we have all been privy to will be lost. Okay. That's simple. So this is where, you know, we got made fun of oh, yeah. by Fox News. But I want to say before we, you know, just show it because it's sort of for two seconds. It's sort of yeah. huge. Be stupid. Um, we've got a huge amount of, of positive press first for the wiki storming events. That's how Fox found it. And they're here. So you can see how the left wing press came in behind us and the blogosphere, et cetera, and was really excited about the concerted effort that was happening at 18 institutions, all of us teaching our students how to use Wikipedia, and then it sort of eventually ended with a thunk here and died because they did such a bad job at this, you know. Okay, here's um, okay. Fox News providing us with a... 20 seconds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. With a teachable moment. Well, 15 universities, including some Ivy League schools, are offering college credit to students who will inject feminist thinking into the popular website Wikipedia. Catherine Timp is a reporter for campusreform.org. Can you hear it? She has more on the storming of Wikipedia projects. Uh, good morning to you, Catherine. Good morning to you, too. Whose idea yes. is this? FemTechNet, which is an organization of feminist scholars, set this up to have students be actually assigned to inject bias of feminism into Wikipedia articles about technology. So anyway, you guys can go and what that would that look like. <laughs> but I also want to say that, again, here's how the network works. David Wadowitz, who's a Wikipedia ambassador, a feminist, and a, 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 a postdoc currently in the humanities and does um, in English, she's one of the most most powerful Wikipedians, thinks about Wikipedia. position with Wikipedians, and Adrian's labor has been huge, as have many others in the network, to build up that part of the project. And this is just to show you, we have our media mentions, the, the negative um, coverage was minor compared to the positive coverage. We had some really good positive media mentions. So I just want to, um, you know, e-news and so on, um, mention a couple of the, um, the sites for Wikipedia, where uh, we can now point to some real outcomes in terms of how the collective cultural archive was changed by a group of people over a short period of time. This is a Wikipedia page um, on the uh, hackathons, the Wikipedia hackathons that happened, or editathons, that happened at Brown University uh, on late Ada Lovelace Day last year. And um, so Wikipedia page, and anybody could participate. They had uh, Anne Fausto Sterling come as a speaker. Um, here are Wikipedians who were attending. These were not necessarily people in the course, but people who had been attracted to the project, who have as their own, they are a part of the Wikipedia editors. Um, then other participants who were people in the, in the courses. Um, suggested topics, because for, especially for people who are new to Wikipedia, you got to give them some place to start. Articles needing creation, this was just an ongoing kind of what do, what do we need, so different, um, different kind of uh, titles and topics that needed expansion, cleanup, creation, and what they end up doing at the end um, is uh, to, to creating a list of the results that came out of this. More than 75 new pages to Wikipedia, primarily focusing on women in science and technology. Um, so these are all there. They were not there before. Ada Lovelace Day. And then articles that they expanded and improved. Um, one of the ones that came out of my class, um, there was no page on heresies in Wikipedia or on the, um, the film called The Heretics, which is, of course, is any of you who know uh, anything about feminist art, is a major kind of movement in feminist art and politics. So um, one of my students created this page. Um, another uh, student created this page, Decriminalizing Sex Work. These are not 
the topics that had been percolating through Wikipedia. So what we're trying to do now is keep track of these. And it, the thing about the wiki storming is that it is not meant to be adversarial in this sense, although it was a, a kind of a galvanizing kind of topic, or a galvanizing rhetorical gesture. But um, it, the wiki, wiki storming um, activity scales really well because there's a lot of labor to be done in fixing or making Wikipedia a more robust digital cultural archive. Close reading what's there and creating just a punch list of what needs to be edited doesn't require any of the procedural literacy to actually edit or author or participate in the talk and and you know debate and get into that just reading for you know uh, kind of I I uh, uneven citation practices women you know who are referred to by their first names and not their last names things like that or you know reading for you know the way in which women are women's uh, citations to women's work are often not linked to other pages, but men's are linked to other pages. So just doing a close reading of what's there, all the way to the much more involved effort, which is to get engaged with the procedural kind of matters of how one authors for Wikipedia that are for those who are really much more interested in kind of contributing novel material. And we are wrapping up here. I guess yes. I want to say that, you know, one of the things that the Wikistorm activi uh, activity, my students loved it. They just loved it. And the idea that uh, feminist dialogues and technology is not just that you're hearing great professors teach you things, but that you're part of that dialogue is a core feminist principle written into the class. And so when you're writing Wikipedia, you're not receiving information, you're producing information. When you're making keyword videos, you're, re you're producing information, not receiving it. And when you're talking with peers, um, the same is true. So we. Um, engaged in any number of collaborative projects outside of the doc. So, what, so where we began, we said Femtech Net was activated to make something or make things. Um, it made the doc, and it's continuing to make the doc, but it's done other things. It's a group of feminists engaged in technology. We wrote the white paper I told you about. We have an accessibility committee that came into life as soon as we started teaching the class because people who were teaching and taking the class realized that there were huge issues we hadn't worked through and began to transcribe and caption everything in real time. We have been done some grant writing, we need to do more. We do presentations and workshops all over the world. Um, we had open office hours and pedagogy workshops um, in the first semester. Um, we made these video dialogues from scratch. We co-teach, we do uh, learning activities. I mean, it goes on. Um, and here you see, um, Two students, two of my undergraduate students, um, I sort of wanted to think about collaborative projects. I, I sort of threw at them, oh, there's this uh, grant op opportunity um, that you guys might want to apply for something. They applied. They received the grant, but the people who gave them the grant thought they were professors. So when they <laughs> showed up with like the seriously the most famous people in digital humanities, up until that moment, they thought they were professors. Then there are these two young women who are undergraduates who've been taking the class, who sit up there on the podium you know, get flown in, et cetera, present incredibly well. And, um, you know, they uh, collaborated with us at the, at the kind of core level as um, speakers, makers, and representatives of the project. And I feel like the same thing occurred with the two, your two students that we saw. That's part of what we're doing here, sort of talking together, but also producing a, you know, international community where young women become part of that conversation, become part of the dialogue. So we're, we're down to our last few slides of our lessons learned as we're kind of looking back. Um, do you want to take this first one? I guess what I would want to say, um, uh, you can look at these lessons that are bullets, but I wanted to add to them the lesson of how hard it is to do things without infrastructure. This is not a lesson that this class learned. It's a lesson that most feminist organizing, other forms of organizing understand, and that without an infrastructure, what you end up doing is building projects on affective and free labor, and this project is entirely built on that. It's not a sustainable model, but it got us incredibly far, and um, something we have to continue to talk about. We had another lesson learned, which was that we had always thought this was gonna be an international project. We really stumbled and failed, ultimately, in the first iteration of the class to go international, and I, I, I will suggest that that was an infrastructure problem more than anything else, so that we could Again, talking Q&A, great length about what the obstacles were, but simply not having a staff, not having money, not having an office to be able to kind of get through the, we had interest around the world, but we did not have 
the kinds of um, support necessary to truly make this an international project, although the will and the desire was there by, by those of us who were producing it and people who were receiving it on the internet. Um, so I, I, I guess I would, leave, I would leave those two. And then, Anne? And then some of the lessons learned that I think are going to be interesting for possible grant, um, grant projects going forward, this would be great great grant opportunities for postdocs. So if you know anyone who's kind of post-dissertation post and is interested in this, you know, the way in which this doc um, provided platforms for experimentation and blended learning, again, tying back to the uh, NSF interest in cyber learning and use of networked infrastructures for learning across different modalities. Um, we're very interested in, at the, at the kind of theoretical level, in exploring the notion of the design of digital learning materials, and in particular, manifesting this notion of boundary objects that learn. Digital learning objects, we thought through feminist science technology theories of boundary objects that then, because of their digital computational nature, can learn through use. Really interesting project. We, have, we know we, we have something interesting to say, we just don't know. We named it early on, but didn't have the money to follow through on it. Right. And then we absolutely have good insights about the kind of new collaboration tools that are needed to really facilitate distributed collaboration and not, you know, so, you know, that enables multiple facilitators and extended range of, of participants and so I, on. Just quickly on that, I would oh. say that you know, that was one of the things that really didn't work. So we produced all these materials, we produced the community, we produced these incredible classes. We produced engaged students, we produced engaged professors, and then somehow we weren't so good at talking to each other. And I thought a lot about that. I was really upset about it, like half of it. I was like sending emails and sending, uh, and then I realized like, again, I could talk to you a greater length about why it didn't work, but I think the mo really didn't work, people were exhausted by this class. <laughs> it's like it was enough to teach this class to their 20 or 400 or 10 students Showing the videos, you know, being on analysis, and like the idea that you would then like reach out and start interacting with Elaine's students, Karen's, it was like, no, no, we can't do it. And the technology was not helping. Mm -hmm. um, it was hindering that. And so in the next iteration, we're going to try and build things in that make mm -hmm. collaboration um, across nodes, across nodes mm -hmm. a stronger part of the experience. So here's where we're going. Um, we, we did assess the first one. We had a committee. Elaine, you were on it, right? Yeah. That made an assessment tool for us that, again, like should happen in real time. But we did assess it, um, you know, interaction, continuing to make the content and hoping to have a more live, a, a stronger infrastructure of support. Right, and I think uh, our two kind of beacons of hope on the horizon are tomorrow when you go to University of Michigan. Uh, Lisa's there gathering some uh, institutional support for this. Laura Wexler at Yale. Yale's interested in getting behind this, wants to um, extend it to their international network. They, they belong to an international consortium. Um, what we need, what Femtech needs, and what the doc needs is it needs an institutional home. It needs some institutional unit to take it on and say we will be the home to facilitate this that then has an institutional commitment to providing the technology um, resources that are needed. So we, we, I, we know it and we will continue to be banging on the doors. That's it. Thank you.